Okay, uh, so why don't we uh, begin with a prayer, and as we did last week, we'll, uh, we'll finish by uh, praying night prayer, also known as Compline, together um, as sort of part of our Advent preparation. But let's begin with this, um, with this prayer. God, we praise you, Father all-powerful, Christ, Lord and Savior, Spirit of love. You reveal yourself in the depths of our being, drawing us to share in your life and your love. One God, three persons, be near to the people formed in your image. Close to the world, your love brings to life. We ask this, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, true and living, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're continuing on with our um, uh, Advent series on who is Jesus. And last week, uh, Chris McCullough took us through the four Gospels, pointing out sort of different aspects of the Gospels, different ways in which they portray Jesus, how we might think about the Gospels. Um, and at the end of his presentation, um, Chris raised the question, well, what exactly was it that Jesus did that was so offensive? Uh, that, that got him killed. Uh, certainly going around healing people wouldn't seem to do that. Certainly talking about how we should love our neighbors wouldn't seem to do that. And what he pointed to is that Je Jesus did and said things, uh, particularly uh, forgiving people's sins, uh, that were things that, according to the understanding of his time, only God could do. So without ever coming out and saying, I am God, Jesus seemed to claim for himself the divine prerogative. Now, uh, that's where Chris left us, and I tonight have the glorious responsibility of talking about who Jesus is in relation to the church's doctrine of the Trinity. Um, now, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is... Uh, is one that often strikes fear into the hearts of preachers when they have to preach on Trinity Sunday. Uh, they're always afraid they're going to get it wrong, and they usually do. Uh, and it seems like it's in... Fought, well, we haven't heard him yet. We have not heard him yet on Trinity Sunday. Uh, but um, uh, somehow, I mean, it seems like some sort of complex celestial me mechanics by which one plus one plus one somehow adds up to one, right? Um, and some people even treat it as if something you're just supposed to accept uh, as a kind of a loyalty test, right? The church gives you this completely absurd idea that God is somehow three and at the same time one in order to simply show that you can be intellectually obedient. Um, and certainly the doctrine of the Trinity is a, is a mystery, according to the traditional Catholic formulation. The two great mysteries of faith are the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation, God becoming flesh. Uh, Father Goff's going to talk about the Incarnation next week. Uh, but uh, certainly the doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery, but that doesn't mean that we can't grow in our understanding of it. And what I want to do tonight is just give, uh, make some stab at helping us grow in our understanding of it. Uh, and the doctrine of the Trinity uh, which really develops in the 4th century as an articulated doctrine, uh, addresses, I would say, two questions that go back to the very origins of Christianity. First, if Jesus claimed for himself prerogatives that could only be true of God, in what sense is Jesus identifying himself with God? In what sense can, can we claim that Jesus is divine? Uh, and then a second question is, how is Jesus related to the other, as it were, divine figures that you find in the New Testament, namely the Father and the Holy Spirit? How could all three of these be God and yet there still only be one God? Christians are, after all, still monotheists. So it's really these two questions. In what sense is Jesus divine? And how is Jesus 
related to the Father and the Spirit, who also seem to be divine, that generate the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, why did it take so long for the doctrine to get formed? Well, I think in some ways for the first three centuries, Christianity was a prescribed religion. And it's not really the case that Christians were being daily fed to the lions, but it was always a possibility. Uh, the, the church was somewhat scattered. Uh, in, in a sense, Christians didn't have the luxury to work, work out the, the fine points of the doctrine. Uh, but the doctrine of the Trinity, I think the importance of it is once the church was legalized, as it were, uh, this issue bubbled up to the surface. It had clearly been stewing for a long time. And so in the early 4th century, the early 300s, uh, you know, the uh, Emperor Constantine legalizes Christianity in 312 AD, and by 325 AD, they have to call a church council, a church meeting of bishops, to address this doctrine of the Trinity. So it's something that bubbled underneath the surface for a long time. So first I want to talk about where, how Christians in the New Testament express their belief that Jesus is a divine figure. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about how Jesus relates to the, the Father and the Spirit in Scripture before we move on and talk a little bit about those fourth century developments uh, at the Council of Nicaea. So first, um, last time, Chris ended by talking about how Jesus forgave sins and that this was something, as it says in the New Testament, Jesus' critics say, how can you say your sins are forgiven? Only God can forgive sins. Um, but there are a number of things that Jesus did that seem to claim for himself certain divine prerogatives. Um, so there's the forgiveness of sins, and particularly, of course, the Jewish people believed that people's sins could be forgiven, but their understanding of it was that you had to follow the rituals prescribed in the law. You had to go to the temple, offer a sin sacrifice, and that was the way you would be cleansed from your sins. What Jesus does is he simply says, your sins are forgiven, right? Um, in a sense, he's putting himself in the place of that whole system in the temple that the law of Moses had set up for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, likewise, if you think about a, a passage like the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says again and again, you, know, you have heard it said, and then he'll quote something from the law, but I say to you. So in a sense, he's putting himself in the position of the lawgiver. And of course, it's God's law, so Jesus is putting himself in the position of God. Also in the New Testament, the very claim that salvation comes through Jesus. Now, if you read the Psalms or you read the book of Isaiah, the constant refrain in the Old Testament is that salvation comes from God alone. Right? It doesn't come from kings. It doesn't come from armies. Salvation comes from God alone. So when after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Christians begin to talk about Jesus as Savior, they're ascribing to Jesus something that the Jewish people would say could only be true of God. So Jesus' claim to divinity really grows out of his words and actions, even if he never comes out and says, I am God. Um, it's almost as if he wants to leave room for faith, right? Um, Jesus will often say, you know, in his parables, let those who have ears to hear, hear. So rather than simply just come out and say, I am God, he wants to evoke people's faith. Um, even though he doesn't say, I am God, he does say uh, the significant phrase, I am, a lot, both in Mark's gospel, which is quite early, and in John's gospel, which is quite late. In fact, in the scene uh, in uh, Mark's gospel, where Jesus is... Uh, uh, Jesus is before the, the, the temple leaders, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the temple council. Um, and uh, 
when Jesus answers you and they ask, are you the Messiah? He says, I am. And then suddenly everybody gets upset because, of course, I am is the name that God reveals to Moses at the burning bush. So there's all these indirect ways in which the New Testament shows Jesus affirming his divinity. Um, now, it's increasingly accepted by biblical scholars that belief in Jesus' divinity is as early as any, as, as early as Christianity itself. Now, this might not, we might, we might be tempted to say, well, of course, uh, but for a number of centuries, the consensus among scholars was, well, no, belief in Jesus' divinity developed later. First, he was just thought of as a prophet, as a teacher, as a rabbi, and then later people began to make these exalted claims for him. But I would say uh, in the last 30 years, the, the consensus among scholars has begun to shift to say that, no, really from the very outset, Christians are making very, very exalted claims for Jesus. Um, and one place you can see this is in Paul's letter to the Philippians, um, in what is sometimes referred to as the Christ hymn in Philippians. And it's one that is probably familiar to you. Um, where, uh, and, and some scholars speculate, we don't have any way of knowing, that Paul might actually be quoting a hymn here, so it would be something that's even older than Paul's letter to the Philippians. So this is within, say, two decades of the death of Jesus. Uh, Paul, Paul writes, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. So Jesus was in the form of God. Right? And he emptied himself, being born in the likeness of men, right? So that Jesus seems to have, prior to his birth to Mary, already existed, as Paul puts it, in the form of God, and then empties himself to be born as a human. Um, and then it can, um, and being born in human likeness and found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Right? Everything, everything in creation is going to bow down to Jesus. Right? Only God, that, you could only say that about God, right? Um, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that word Lord is very significant because that I am name that God has in the Old Testament, the way it gets translated into Greek is kurios, or Lord, right? So the, uh, the name, the fact that Jesus is, is confessed as Lord is an indication of his divine status. And this is a very, very early text. Right? This is among the earliest texts we have in the New Testament. So it seems that from the very beginning, Christians ascribe divinity to Jesus. Um, why? Well, I think the most obvious answer is that in their experience of salvation through the resurrected Jesus, they felt that they were experiencing God's salvation in their lives in a very, very direct way. Way. When did Christians start thinking Jesus was God? I would say probably when he rose from the dead and appeared to them, right? Um, uh, and some scholars who are skeptical say, well, we don't know if these were delusions or whatever, will still say, um, yeah, that's probably whatever, whatever the resurrection was, that was the thing that suddenly made them make these rather extraordinary claims about this rabbi from Nazareth. Um, so already in the New Testament, we have this claim to divinity for Jesus. And so then the question is, well, what exactly do we mean by this? And, well, how is Jesus as a divine figure related to the God he calls Father? And 
this Holy Spirit, which particularly in the early church was you know, a very, very palpable presence, right? You can read in the book of Acts, you know, it's the, the Holy Spirit's in some ways the main character of the book of Acts. But, um, so that's that second question. Well, if, if we want to claim that Jesus is God, in what sense is he God, and how is him being God related to the Father and the Spirit? I mean, another way to put it is that Jesus isn't the only one in the New Testament who does God-like things. Uh, one way I like to think about this is um, in terms of the scenes of Jesus' baptism. Right? Uh, so just to take Mark, because that's the earliest account we have of Jesus' baptism. It says, Mark says, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opened and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So in this scene of the baptism of Jesus, right at the outset of Mark's gospel, Mark doesn't have birth stories about Jesus. He just starts starts right in with the baptism. We have these three characters, right? We have Jesus being baptized. We have the Spirit who, when the heavens are opened, descends on him like a dove. And then we have the voice from heaven calling Jesus, my beloved Son, the voice of the Father. So throughout the New Testament, we have these, as it were, three divine figures, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and so then the question for the early Christians was, well, how do we understand the relationship between these three in such a way that you don't end up with three gods, right? Like, I don't know, Saturn, you know, I don't know, Mars and Mercury, right? <laughs> um, I mean, the Romans were familiar with having multiple gods, right? In the ancient world, everybody had multiple gods. The Jews were weird because they only had one god. And of course, the first Christians were Jews and still thought of themselves as Jews. They were just Jews who believed in God, that God's Messiah had come. So they weren't going to just suddenly, you know, say, oh, well, now we've got a bunch of gods. That's great. Now we're just like everybody else. So we finally we fit in, right? Got rid of that one God. No, they they believed. Well, there's only one God, and yet we've got these three divine figures. Right? Um, and there were two early early on. There emer there emerged two possible solutions to this that were widely seen to not be quite adequate, or maybe very much not adequate. Um, the first is sometimes called adoptionism. And this is basically the idea that uh, Jesus is really just a human being, but he's such a good human being that God, as it were, pays him the compliment of calling him his son. Right? So that Jesus is sort of given a divine status that's not really his by nature, right? Um, uh, so, sort of the way in which the king might choose an heir who is not his actual son, right? Um, and Christians generally felt that this did not quite capture what they wanted to say about Jesus. Right? That Jesus wasn't just a really, really good person, and that's why we call him Son of God, that somehow the God that they as Jews had been worshiping all along was now present to them in physical form in Jesus. Um, not some, you know, uh, you know, not some sort of second-rate God or just some, some really good person. Um, I mean, you, if you remember like that, that passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians, there's this idea that Jesus, before he's even born of Mary, is in the form of God. Right? So this adoptionist view didn't really fit with that model. Right? Rather than God coming to us, the adoptionist kind of says that we can somehow 
by being really good people, be kind of pulled up to God. Um, but the whole point of Jesus was that he, God coming to us, right? So that was one. You know, Jesus has the really good person. Uh, the other way is sometimes referred to as modalism, if you want a name for it, modalism. Uh, but this is basically the idea that, well, there's only one God, but this God manifests himself in three different ways. In the Old Testament, God manifested himself as the Father, the Creator. During the life of Jesus, God is manifesting himself as, as Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is how God is manifesting himself today. Now, some of you might be going, I thought that was the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> um, well, no. And for um, uh, a, a couple of reasons. I mean, I sometimes call modalism the, the divine job description approach to the Trinity, right? God's got three different things to do, so we give him three different names. It's sort of like um, when I'm teaching at Loyola University, my students call me Dr. Bowerschmidt. When I'm here at the cathedral, people call me Deacon Fritz. And my children, when I'm being a father, call me dad. Right? So I've got these three different names for these three different kind of roles I play in the world, but I'm just one person. Right? Um, the problem with that is that throughout the Gospels, you see, particularly in Jesus's relationship to the Father, you see this element of relation, right? Jesus prays to the Father when he's in the garden. Right? Um, is he talking to himself? No, there's a dialogue there. There's a relationship there. Right? Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. At the end of God, John's Gospel, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Is he, is he sending himself upon them? Well, no, there's this, there's this sense of uh, an interrelatedness to these three figures that if it's, I mean, if I started talking about myself as if, you know, well, you know, I was talking to Dr. Bowerschmidt the other day, and he said about the Trinity, and, and you know, and, and Deacon Fritz rightly objected, you know, you would think I was insane, right? Uh, so uh, this modalist, this divine job description approach was seen to be inadequate because what it missed, well, it captured the idea that Jesus is really God. What it missed is the sense that there's an interrelational nature to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. That's not how we talk about ourselves, right? I mean, I suppose I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror and go, oh, you're the most wonderful person in the world. I'm very happy with you. But uh, generally, that's not how we speak. Right? That's something you would say to somebody else. You are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Right? So there's this relational aspect to these three, Father, Son, and Spirit, that the divine job description approach simply doesn't capture. Right? So these were early attempts to try and figure out how you could both speak of Jesus as divine and still say that though Father, Son, and Spirit are divine, there's only one. The adoptionists kind of just say, well, Jesus is kind of divine-ish. You know? um, he's divine in the way, I don't know, Bette Midler is or something. You know? um, uh, the modalists say, well, yeah, Jesus is divine. In fact, he's the same as the Father. He's identical with the Father and the Spirit. Um, so these early attempts to understand the Trinity uh, were seen to be inadequate. Um, but then it was kind of sort of left there. I mean, theologians were writing about the Trinity. They were trying to understand it. But there wasn't a sense that uh, th there wasn't a kind of an impetus to come up with, to kind of work out the details, I guess I would say. Um, before I go now, then move on to talk about what led to the formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity as we know it now, uh, let me just pause and ask, so 
of what I've said so far, are there are there questions or comments or where would Arianism fall? They're about to they're about to appear on the scene. But I wanted to pause for a second before we got to Arianism. <laughs> Um, so, so what I really want to just convey is that the doctrine of the Trinity is rooted in the Scripture. I mean, sometimes people will say, you know, the Trinity is not found in the Bible. Um, well, that's not really true. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but certainly the Father, Son, and the Spirit are found in the Bible, right? Um, and the sense that they are somehow one yet somehow different, I think, is also found in the Bible. Okay, well then, Arianism. This is where I have a chart for you. I was going to do this on PowerPoint, but I couldn't figure out the technology here. So, I don't know if you, for the audience at home. <laughs> okay. Um, So on Sundays, after the homily, we typically say the Nicene Creed, right? And what I want to talk about next is, well, where does this creed come from? And at least in certain key passages, what is it trying to say? Why does it say what it says? Um, so we're talking the early 4th century, the early 300s. Christianity has just been legalized. And a uh, priest in the church of Alexandria, Egypt, not Virginia, Alexandria, Egypt, uh, named Arius, uh, is a very, very popular teacher. And his teaching on the Trinity begins to gain traction. And Arius is concerned with the things that we've been just talking about. In what sense is Jesus divine? And how can you have... Uh, in particular, a divine Jesus and a divine Father and still only one God. Arius didn't actually talk about the Holy Spirit very much uh, at this point. He was mainly concerned about the relationship of Jesus the Son and God the Father, or also, alternatively, Jesus the Word. That's the terminology that comes from the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You, you can already see that in John's gospel, right? The word is both with God and is God, right? So there's that element of being with, but also an element of identity. So what Arius began teaching, his solution to this problem was that Jesus wasn't God, strictly speaking. He was sort of God-ish, okay? Um, it's a little bit different from adoptionism in that Arius did believe that Jesus existed, that the Son existed, the Word existed prior to Mary giving birth to Jesus. But the Son that existed prior to Mary giving birth to Jesus was a being that God created, something like the angel. So Jesus for Arius was like a super angel, the greatest of angels, the first ever created, right? Created at the very instant of the world's beginning, but still created. Um, I mean, one way to think about it is that Arius would say, well, we call Jesus divine, but divinity is kind of on a spectrum, right? You have a spectrum, and at one end you have God the Father, clearly divine, and at the other end, you have, you know, rocks and trees and slime mold, clearly not divine, right? And in between, you've got this kind of spectrum. And Jesus is very, very far to this side of the spectrum, where God the Father is, but not quite as far, right? Um, and... The way in which Arius tried to make this distinction between Jesus and God the Father, between the Son and the Father, was by this slogan that he came up with, which was, there was when he was not. 
There was when he was not. Meaning, to be God is to be eternal. To be a creature is to exist in time, to be temporal, right? And Jesus, as a creature, even if he begins to be at the very first possible moment that anything could be that's not God, there's still, in a sense, a time when he was not, because he does not share the full eternity of God the Father. Um, apparently, this slogan really caught on. You know, there would be like these theological debates, and Arius' followers would be like in the in the audience, and they would start chanting, "There was when he was not. There was when he was not." Kind of drowning out the. It was it was sort of the fourth century equivalent of lock her up. You know, um, it'd be like Arian rallies, and people would be going, "There was when he was not. There was when he was not." Um, or I guess now it's "Let's go, Brandon," or whatever. Yeah, you know, the people chant, right? Um, uh, well, this teaching of areas, I mean, a lot of people say, well, this kind of makes sense. So the way in which the Son is distinct from the Father is that the Father is eternal and the Son is not. And others said, but what that does is that makes the Son into a creature. And what that means is if salvation comes through a creature, are we really saved? Doesn't salvation come from God alone? Isn't that kind of the whole biblical point? Um, and so a controversy arose. Arius' bishop, a guy named Alexander, yes, Alexander of Alexandria, um, uh, excommunicated him. Uh, there was, but, but a lot of people said, well, I mean, you know, Arius at least has a way of solving this issue of how the Son and the Father differ from each other, that the Father's eternal and the Son's temporal. Um, but can you come up with something better? So, uh, the, uh, it was actually the Emperor Constantine who had recently legalized Christianity suddenly discovers they're squabbling with each other. He says, you guys have to get your house in order. So he tells them, I'm going to call all you, you bishops together at a place called Nicaea, which is right outside of Constantinople in what is today Turkey, and you guys are going to sort this out. And Arius was there, um, and St. Nicholas, whose feast day we just celebrated, he was there as well. Actually, St. Nicholas was a Turkish bishop in the 4th century. Um, uh, and he did. Is well, that's the, there's the story that at some point in the proceedings he got so angry at Eric with Arius he punched him. So I prefer to think that St. Nicholas just put him on the naughty list. Okay. You know? <laughs> he, he got coal in his stocking that year. Um, so this, this chart I gave you is trying to map out the, the two different positions. Um, and the, the things that are in the center here are the things that both sides agree on, Arius and what will become the consensus position of the Council of Nicaea. Um, they all agree that you can divide things that exist into two columns, those things that are created, pretty much everything we see around us. No, no, not pretty much everything we see around us. And what is uncreated, and what is uncreated is God. So we have our little errors, right? If it's Uncreated and eternal, it's God. If it's created and temporal, it's not God. Okay? Um, and everybody agreed that the Father, God the Father, fell on that uncreated, divine, eternal side of this law. Okay? Um, and they agreed on a bunch of other stuff that fell on the created side of the law. Angels, human beings, other creatures. Um, uh, those were clearly all created things. Right? Where they differ is where the Son, or the Word, and the Holy Spirit fell. Do they fall on that uncreated, eternal God side of the line, or that created, temporal, not God side? Now, I've also got a line here between things that are spiritual and material. You'll notice human beings are right on that line because we're both spiritual and material, right? 
we've got, we've got minds and bodies, souls and bodies. Um, angels are purely spiritual, but they're still creatures, right? And then we have purely material creatures like rocks and trees and things like that. Um, this is kind of an oversimplification because most ancient people thought that anything that was alive had a soul of some sort. But we'll, 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 we're trying to keep it as simple as, as possible. Um, so you'll notice on Arius' side, he's got the Son and the Holy Spirit above the angels, right? He's like, look, I'm not, I'm not an adoptionist. I'm not saying that Jesus is just a good man who we call God because he's such a good man. I'm saying that Jesus is the greatest thing ever made by God. The Son is the most perfect being that God has brought forth. Um, and likewise, the Holy Spirit. Um, but the Son is not the Father, and therefore the Son is not uncreated. The Son is not eternal. The Son is not, strictly speaking, God. Close to God as a creature can be, but not God. The bishops at the Council of Nicaea the solution that they worked out was first, the Son and the Word are on the same side of this fundamental division between created and uncreated. They're on the same side as God the Father, um, uh, not on the side of creatures. Right? So the Son and the Holy Spirit are not creatures. God did not make them. God did not, as it were, will them into being the way that God has willed everything else into being. They are eternal. Right? They have always been with the Father. Father, Son, and Spirit are, are eternal beings. They're not, the, the Son and the Spirit don't begin to be at some point in time. Obviously, Jesus takes on human flesh. The Son takes on human flesh at a particular point in time. And Father Justin's going to take us through that next week. Um, but the Son, who who takes on flesh has always existed along with the Father and the Spirit. Right? So they're on this eternal, uncreated God side of the line. Um, the, the term that the bishops use, which they kind of have to invent <clears throat> to express this, uh, is that the Son and the Spirit are homo usius with the Father. Um, if you look over in the little box over here, I've got that. You know, it's a Greek word that means the same. It's very hard to translate usia. It, it can mean being. It can mean essence. Um, it's like whatever it is that makes God God, namely not being created. The Son is is that as much as the Father is. So they're homo usius. Um, so they invent this. Well, then, how are the Son and the Spirit different from the Father? Well, the difference is that the Father, as Father, begets or generates the Son and the Spirit. Right? That they find their source in Him, but not in the way that creatures do. God wills creation into being. Right? And time begins when creation begins. But the Son and the Spirit, they come forth from God by nature, right? eternal. They are who God is. Um, so the difference is that God the Father is unbegotten or ungenerated. Uh, and the Son and the Spirit are begotten and generated. And so that's how they, that's how you make that, they can make a distinction between them. The Son comes forth from the Father. The Father doesn't come forth from the Son. But the Son comes forth from the Father eternally. Um, now, um, I, you know, I had, a number of years ago I had a student ask me, like, could you give me an example? And, I, and the short answer is, like, well, no, you can't, because creatures, there's nothing in the created world that is like this. Of course, the language of Father and Son gives us some indication, right? You know, my son shares the same, my human nature, right? I share, when, when I have a child, son or a daughter, I've got both, um, 
I, I share my human nature with them in begetting, being, becoming their father, right? Um, in a way that when I make something, like when I, say, made this handout, when, it, when I make something, this thing doesn't share my nature, right? It, it's a different kind of thing than I am. But in being a parent, a mother or a father of a child, you are sharing your, your, what you are, a human being, with your child. So the language, I mean, it's not an accident that scripture uses this language of father and son, right? Because we want to say that the father shares his nature with his son, right? Just the way I have shared my nature with my sons and daughter. Um, another, another example, this idea of something that can be begotten or generated, yet not in a temporal sense this may help nobody it helps it, it helped like a couple math majors in my class but if you think about the way in which you can uh take a number and reduce it to its prime factors right so you have the number i don't know 10 you reduce it to its prime factors two and five um or i, I suppose one two and five right um in a sense those factors have come from that number, but it's not like they didn't exist. You know, one, two, and five have existed at the same time 10 has since there have been numbers, which I don't know when the numbers started to be. I think probably, they, numbers might be eternal too, I don't know, the mind of God. But in any case, um, uh, so you can have something that is, as it were, derived from something else, yet not in a way that involves uh, a, a process in time. I don't know. That, that occasion will help a math major. So, um, what I wanted then to, to I put alongside here then uh, a couple, some key passages from the Nicene Creed, right? And this, in particular, this top passage was the the part that gave them the biggest headaches at the Council of Nicaea, trying to figure out how to express this. Um, so, as we say at Mass, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, right? born of the Father before all ages. Okay. So you've got this language of, of birth. I mean, it seems kind of strangely born of the Father, right? I think that's, I think of it as the Creed's way of saying, we're not really talking about a biological process here. We usually would say born of a mother, right? We're not talking biological processes. We're talking metaphors here. But born of the Father before all ages, on that eternal side of the law, right? I mean, I don't know if you, when you're saying the creed, if maybe you're like me, you're thinking about these things. Um, uh, but, but this was a really crucial point to make against Arian, Arius, uh, that the Son, yes, is born of the Father. He's not identical with the Father, the way the Moodleists said. He comes forth from the Father, but before all ages, before there is in time. And he's God from God, light from light. So you kind of get this image of the way in which, you know, a beam of light comes forth from the sun, right? Um, and as if to drive the point home against Arius, it's not enough to just say God from God, true God from true God, right? Jesus is not God-ish, right? he's true God. In the same way that the Father is true God, right? Begotten, not made. More like the way in which I have begotten my children and less like the way I've made this handout, right? Begotten, not made. I think in the old translation of the creed, I think, didn't we say begotten, not created, I think? Um, this is probably closer to the Latin, but in some ways created makes the theological point, right? So that the way in which the Son comes forth from the Father is different from the way in which God makes creation. Uh, and then you get this crucial word, consubstantial with the Father. And that's how that Greek word homoousios gets translated. Right? So homoousios was their way of saying that the Son is 
whatever it is that makes God God, the Son is it as much as the Father is. So the usia, the essence of divinity, is the same. Now, um, this is all taking place in Greek, right? Um, this debate, the formulation of this creed. Uh, once it's all hammered out, they then got to figure out a way to translate it into Latin. So they come up with this term consubstantialis um, as equivalent to homoousius. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you remember 10 years ago when we got the new translation, we shifted from saying one in being with the Father, which was a way, an attempt to translate homoousius, uh, to say consubstantial, which is basically just taking the Latin word and using it as if it's an English word. Um, I'm not sure either one is immediately apparent what it's saying. Um, I suppose the advantage of consubstantial is that it at least makes you go, I wonder what that means. I'm pretty sure I don't know what that means, but I might want to go find out what that means. And what it means simply is that everything that makes God God is true of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Right? They all share the identity of God with the exception that the Father generates, the Father begets the Son, the Father generates the Holy Spirit. Um, through him all things were made. Right? So that might seem you know, a strange way to end that, but the point is that everything is made through the Son. The Son is not himself something that is made. The Son, as much as the Father, is the creator. A number of years ago, it was, um, uh, it kind of became a thing. People began worrying about the, the uh, masculine nature of the names of the persons of the Trinity, between Father and Son. And so they, people started to come up with substitutes for them, such as you know, Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit. The problem, of course, with this is that, according to the Creed, the Son is just as much the Creator as the Father is. All things are made through Him. Right? Um, and that's getting back a little bit to that divine job description. Um, I would say the general tendency I at least find among people in theology is, like, let's stick with these names. They're in the Bible. They're in the creeds, Father, Son, and Spirit. We can say, you know, the Father's not biologically male. You know, the Eternal Son's not biologically male. But in incarnate form, he's, he's, he's biologically male. Um, but these are the scriptural, the scriptural terms. Um, now, next time, uh, Father Justin's going to talk about the, the incarnation, uh, but I did want to include what comes next in the creed. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. So, as the Nicene Creed conceives of it, what, what salvation consists in is this uncreated, eternal Son, who is true God from true God, crosses this fundamental barrier between the uncreated and the created to become, to, as it were, become a creature like we are, right? Um, incarnate of the Virgin Mary, taking flesh of the Virgin Mary, and became man. Uh, Father Justin will, as I said, will we'll talk about this more next week. In what sense do we speak of Jesus as both divine and human? How could Jesus be both the uncreated Son and yet someone who begins to be in time in the womb of Mary? Um, I don't know which of us has the harder job. Uh, Two fundamental mysteries of the faith. Um, well, the position that gets hammered out at Nicaea, it doesn't command immediate assent from everybody. There's some people who say, well, you've introduced this term homoousius. It's not in the Bible. It's not a term we've used before. We're not quite sure what it means. Is that really the best term? Um, uh, some people said, well, maybe instead of homoousius, so same essence. Uh, maybe we should say homoiousius, which is similar essence, you know. 
Um, so they wanted to insert a little I in there. I don't know if you ever hear somebody say it doesn't matter one iota. Iota is the Greek letter for I, and it's like comes from this. I'm told comes from this debate over Homo Usius versus Homo Usius. Um, uh, so it took a number of decades, and it's really only at a council held in Constantinople in the year 381 AD uh, that they uh, sort of came up with the final version of the creed, uh, and it kind of became the creed that everybody accepted. So we're talking almost 60 years of ongoing debate. You know, uh, so we had in the early 1960s, we had the Second Vatican Council, right? So we're, we're just about 60 years later. We probably shouldn't feel bad if people are still arguing about what Vatican II meant, because 60 years after Nicaea, they were still arguing about what Nicaea meant. Um, and so the creed we say at Mass is actually, strictly speaking, not the Nicene Creed, but it's the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. You can see why we just call it the Nicene Creed. That's a lot easier to say. Uh, what did they add at Constantinople? Um, uh, I think they added the true God from or, or it's one of those things, God from God, or true God from true God, they might have added. But all the stuff, the Nicene Creed just ended, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, period. And they added all the other stuff we say, Lord and giver of life, proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, spoken through all that stuff that follows. That was added 60 years later, partly because they wanted to flesh out what they said about the Holy Spirit. Um, but it was really only at that council. So, you know, sometimes we can get kind of impatient with the church, like we want controversy settled, you know, yesterday. Um, but here is a controversy in the church about what is the very nature of God and in what sense is Jesus our Savior divine? I mean, that's a pretty fundamental controversy. And it went on for decades. So I think this is one reason why it's good to study the history of the church. It can give you a little bit of perspective, you know, particularly as modern people. We want things like done immediately, right? We want our pizza in 15 minutes, right? Um, so let's see. Um, so if you look on the other side of this, this is just... Um, for those at home. Uh, uh, so the top, this is, I, I'm not quite sure at what point this little sort of chart uh, or emblem uh, emerged. You find it in certainly in the Middle Ages. But it's simply an attempt to try and say, look, this is when we say the creed, this is what we want to affirm. We want to affirm that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Right? So against say, the adoptionist or Arius, the Son is God in the same way that the Father is God. And the Holy Spirit is God in the same way as the Father and the Son. But against the modalists, who want to say they're just three names for the same thing, the Father is not the Son, because the Father begets the Son. The Father is not the Holy Spirit, because the, the Father generates the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, and this is where you get into controversies between East and West on why they're not the same, uh, which I won't really go into, but it has to do with the fact that at least we Roman Catholics believe that it's the Father and the Son together who generate the Holy Spirit. That's why we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. They don't have that and the Son in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So... So look, there's a little inside of baseball, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's a point of controversy. Um, but the reason the Son and the Holy Spirit are different is that the Son comes forth from the Father, the Spirit comes forth from the Father and the Son together. So that creates that difference. And so in terms of our doctrine, what we say is uh, what is one in God is the usia, to use the Greek term, or the substantia, to use the Latin term. And these could be translated as nature or essence. Um, 
could maybe be translated as being. Uh, what is three in God are in Greek the hypostases, uh, in Latin the personae, or we tend to say in English the persons, right? So Father, Son, and Spirit are the three persons of the Trinity. Uh, though I think hy the Greek word hypostasis really means like an entity with a distinct, something with a distinct identity. Um, so that's why I said three entities. Um, so then let me, let me pause here and see what comments or questions you all have. Pat? Uh, when you read the first chapter of John's Gospel, does not a lot of this come out of the a lot of that in there? Yeah, and in some ways I probably could have spent a little bit more time talking about that opening chapter of John's Gospel. Um, particularly, as, as I noted, you know, a lot of this debate is carried on in terms of talking either about the Son or uh, uh, the Word, and that, that terminology of Word, or the Greek term is logos, which can also mean reason or idea, um, comes from John's Gospel. And as I said, you know, in the beginning was the Word. Now, of course, Arius would say, well, that just means that the Word is the first thing created, right? Um, uh, but the opponents of Arius would say, uh, no, it says all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he must not be made. Doesn't that actually say he was God? Doesn't right. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So there's that relational element. And the Word was God. Um, uh, so you would think that that would settle it. But Arius would say, well, I mean, the term God is flexible, right? I mean, it does say in the Psalms, you know, you shall be as gods, right? So there are a couple places you can find in the Bible where God is used to refer to uh, beings that are created by God, but have a kind of an exalted status, right? So that's what Arius would say, um, that this is, uh, the term God is being used metaphorically here, right? Yeah. Another question. Well, uh, as far as timeline and content, what about the Apostles' Creed in the 19th century? Yeah, the origins of the Apostles' Creed is uh, is a bit mysterious. Um, I mean, the name suggests that it comes from the Apostles, and there are legends that uh, you divide it up into uh, 12 um, articles, you know, 12 statements, and you assign one to each of the apostles. And not, not Judas. I think the idea is that it's after the resurrection, once they've replaced Judas, uh, that they come up with it. Kind of fun speculating. Which one did Judas come up with? Um, but uh, uh, it's, I think most scholars think that uh, the Apostles' Creed is some form of um, profession of faith that was used at baptism. Uh, probably in the city of Rome, and maybe, uh, I mean, we, we have things from the probably third century that are very similar, not identical to the Apostles' Creed, but that are similar to the Apostles' Creed, used in baptismal liturgies. Um, probably the Apostles' Creed as we have today is from like maybe the fifth or the sixth century. Um, but it but it was associated with baptisms, and we still use it or a form of it in baptism or in renewing baptismal vows on Easter Sunday, right? That's a form of the Apostles' Creed that we use. So, uh, so it's generally thought that the Apostles' Creed, as we have it today, is probably later than the Nicene Creed, and it's a creed that only is really used in the Western part of the Church, so the European part. So, like the Eastern Orthodox don't don't use the Apostles' Creed. I mean, they wouldn't say anything's wrong with that. It's just, you know, uh, not a creed they use. Yeah, there's just one more. Sure. Is it Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is a creative being? I think that's right. I think it's Jehovah's Witnesses, who are basically Arians, right? They think that Jesus is this kind of created angelic being who, who takes on flesh. Um, and 
I think if I if I recall correctly, you can like the Bible, Jehovah's Witnesses use the beginning of John's Gospel. They translate it as, and the word was a God, meaning a divine being. Um, I think the they're saying isn't there saying a man is God once was isn't it? Um, and that, that, that might be the Mormons, okay? Because the Mormons have this idea that we all become gods. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think part of the problem is that in Greek you don't have an in, you have a definite article, you have a, a the, but you don't have an indefinite article, an a, uh, an a uh, or an a. So you kind of have to see if they're implied. And so what the Jehovah's Witnesses can do is they can say, well, you could translate the Greek as the word was a god. Um, something distinct from the God. Um, so, into great questions. Other questions? Makes my job so much easier when people ask questions. <laughs> what, what about when, doesn't Jesus say that the Father is greater than him? Right, right. And, and generally, um, if you look in the theological tradition, they have there's two different ways of, of addressing this. One is to say Jesus is referring to himself in his incarnate form and his you know in terms of his human nature. Uh, the other is to say that well the Father is greater in the sense that the Father begets and the Son is begotten, right? So that there is that there is a kind of an asymmetry, even though it's true God begetting true God, one is still the begetter. And one is still the begotten. I always like to, you know, remind my children, I begot you. You show some respect to me. Um, so it's usually either either it's Jesus is referring to himself in his incarnate form, saying the Father is greater than I, or it's a way of acknowledging that the Father has a kind of a kind of a primacy as the begetter, um, and the Son as begotten. But that's a that's and that's exactly the kinds of scriptural passages that Arius and his followers would, would point to. It's in the Bible, right? It's in the Bible, right? Which never which never actually solves any theological dispute, right? Because then you have to say, but what does it mean, right? Well, let me let me just kind of wrap up by. Uh, by addressing the question that I think some people do bring to the, the doctrine of the Trinity, which is, so what? Okay. Um, so what? I mean, this is, this is a lot of intellectual sweat that's been generated. Um, does it really make any difference to how we go about living our Christian lives? And I think, well, I, I've got a professional stake in saying, yes, it does. Um, one, it's a way to affirm that the one whom we encounter in Jesus Christ is truly God. Right? That, that goes back to that essential Christian affirmation that Christ is divine. Not sort of divine, not God-ish, but Jesus is true God from true God. Um, and that gives us a particular picture of how salvation works, right? God does not send an emissary to us God comes to us, the person of God the Son comes to us to take our human flesh, to be as present to us as is possible to be, right? to inhabit our human condition, um, not as some sort of go-between that God has created for this purpose, um, but God himself coming to us, that Jesus, as we celebrate you know, during Advent and Christmas, is Emmanuel. God, God is with us. Um, so that's that's one thing I think that the doctrine of the Trinity. That's not so much. Uh, that's the belief that, in a sense, entails the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. It's because we have this belief that we come up with the doctrine of the Trinity. On the other end, though, I think once you have the doctrine of the Trinity, it also says something really intriguing about the being of God. In that is that that God, God's existence is an interpersonal existence. God is not some lonely monad, right? As Aristotle's God thought contemplating itself, right? No, that God is in fact a life, 
God is generative, not simply of creation, but even prior to creation. Apart from creation, God is this generative life process of the Son and the Spirit eternally coming forth from the Father. Um, and what that seems to say is that relationality is at the heart of reality. Um, Pope John Paul II, uh, in what I think, and he's not the only person, but he was Pope, so you know it's pretty important when he says it. I mean, he said that one of the things the doctrine of the Trinity shows us is the importance of our interpersonal relations, right? That the meaning, the, the way, the, the fact that being in relationship with other people is so deeply satisfying and meaningful to us makes sense because that's the very nature of reality that God has created. That God, who is <clears throat> within God relational, creates a world that by its very nature is relational. Um, and so it gives us a picture of God not as Aristotle's thought thinking itself, essentially unrelated to the world. Aristotle thought that God didn't even know the world existed. Um, uh, but rather a God who is, uh, as it were, a life process, a dynamic life process that then brings forth from within that process a, the world that we have that reflects God's relational nature. Um, one example I came up with a, a year, years ago now um, to think about is, um, it, it also says something about the way in which our existence is a free gift from God. Um, if God was kind of the lonely monad, the thought thinking itself, you, we might be tempted to think that God created us so that God didn't have to be alone. Right? God was lonely. And so God said, oh, I'm going to make some beings to kind of keep me company. Uh, and what that would mean is that God created us out of a need, out of some kind of something God lacked, right? Uh, but what the doctrine of the Trinity says is that no, God didn't lack anything. God was an interpersonal relationship of love, right? I mean, when we call when we say that God is love, First John, right? God is interpersonal. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and that love is the Holy Spirit. Um, so God didn't create us because God was lonely, because God needed someone to keep God company. God created us because God is this dynamic force of love, and it, as it were, overflows. It's sort of like, think about a couple who decide they're going to have a child. I think it makes a real difference whether the couple feels like there's something lacking in our relationship with each other. So let's have a child and maybe that will fix it. That's like a recipe for disaster, right? I mean, it might work out because God is provident, but you know, to say there's something lacking in our relationship, so I think we should have a child and that's going to fix it. What that does is it puts a big burden on the child to fulfill some lack in the parents. But what if the parents, what if they, their decision to have a child is because their relationship with each other is so fulfilling, they want to share the love they have for each other with something else. And I think God's creation of the world is more like that because God is already in, as it were, a fulfilling relationship with love and our world is the overflow of that love, right? And what that means is, God didn't create us so that we can do something for God. God created us to just be ourselves, right? Um, we and of course, you know, God has a will for us. Um, God has, you know, God wants us to find our fulfillment in God, but that's because it's good for us, not because God needs us, right? Um, and and that I think is a very freeing notion. Um, so I think one of the, the, the other things the doctrine of the Trinity does is it gives us a picture of God as a God who is perfect fulfillment and yet not somehow not static, right? A God who is eternal, yet somehow still 
a dynamic process of love. So I think uh, the Trinity, in a sense, solves the problem of talking about Jesus as divine, but it also gives us resources for thinking about what it means to say that God is love. Um, so, uh, that's what I had prepared to say. Are there any final questions or comments? Uh, I'll try it lately, <laughs> knowing that I'm in the hot seat next week, but...